Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton. Section. A Manifesto. Introductory quote. Let a new earth rise. Let another world be born. Let a bloody peace be written in the sky. Let a second generation full of courage issue forth. Let a people loving freedom come to growth. Let a beauty full of healing and a strength full of final clenching be the pulsing of in our spirits and our blood. Let the martial songs be written. Let the dirges disappear. Let a race of men now rise and take control. End of quote. By Margaret Walker. For my people. Revolutionary Suicide. The Way of Liberation. For 22 months in the California men's colony at San Luis, San Luis Obispo, after my first trial for the death of patrolman John Frey, I was almost continually in solitary confinement. There, in a four by six cell, except for books and papers relating to my case, I was allowed no reading material. Despite the rigid enforcement of this rule, Inmates sometimes slipped magazines under my door when the guards were not looking. One that reached me was the May 1970 issue of Ebony Magazine. It contained an article written by Lacey Banco, summarizing the work of Dr. Herbert Hendon, who had done a comparative study on suicide among black people in the major American cities. Dr. Hendon found that the suicide rate among black men between the ages of 19 and 35 had doubled in the past 10 to 15 years, surpassing the rate for whites in the same age range. The article had, and still has, a profound effect on me. I have thought long and hard about its implications. The Ebony article brought to mind Durkheim's classic study, Suicide, a book I had read earlier while studying sociology at Oakland City College. To Durkheim, all types of suicide are related to social conditions. He maintains that the primary cause of suicide is not individual temperament, but forces in the social environment. In other words, Suicide is caused primarily by external factors, not internal ones. As I thought about the conditions of black people and about Dr. Hendon's study, I began to develop Durkheim's analysis and apply it to the black experience in the United States. This eventually led to the concept of revolutionary suicide. To understand revolutionary suicide, it is first necessary to have an idea of reactionary suicide, for the two are very different. Dr. Hendon was describing reactionary suicide, the reaction of a man who takes his own life in response to social conditions that overwhelm him and condemn him to helplessness. The young black men in his study had been deprived of human dignity crushed by oppressive forces, and denied their right to live as proud and free human beings. A section in Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment provides a good analogy. One of the characters, Marmeladov, a very poor man, argues that poverty is not a vice. In poverty, he says, a man can attain the innate nobility of the soul that is not possible in beggary. For while society may drive the poor man out with a stick, the beggar will be swept out with a broom. Why? Because the beggar is totally demeaned, his dignity lost. Finally, bereft of self-respect, immobilized by fear and despair, he sinks into self-murder. 
This is reactionary suicide. Connected to reactionary suicide, although even more painful and degrading, is a spiritual death that has been the experience of millions of black people in the United States. This death is found everywhere today in the black community. Its victims have ceased to fight the forms of oppression that drink their blood. The common attitude has long been, what's the use? If a man rises up against a power as great as the United States, he will not survive. Believing this, many blacks have been driven to a death of the spirit rather than of the flesh, lapsing into lives of quiet desperation. Yet all the while, in the heart of every black, there is the hope that life will somehow change in the future. I do not think that life will change for the better without an assault on the establishment which goes on exploiting the wretched of the earth. Footnote for establishment. The power structure based on the economic infrastructure, propped up and reinforced by the media and all the secondary educational and cultural institutions. This belief lies at the heart of the concept of revolutionary suicide. Thus, it is better to oppose the forces that would drive me to self-murder than to endure them. Although I risk the likelihood of death, there is at least the possibility, if not the probability, of changing intolerable conditions. This possibility is important because much in human existence is based upon hope without any real understanding of the odds. Indeed, we are all, black and white alike, ill in the same way, mortally ill. But before we die, how shall we live? I say, with hope and dignity. And if premature death is the result, that death has a meaning reactionary suicide can never have. It is the price of self-respect. Revolutionary suicide does not mean that I and my comrades have a death wish. It means just the opposite. We have such a strong desire to live with hope and human dignity that existence without them is impossible. When reactionary forces crush us, we must move against these forces, even at the risk of death. We will have to be driven out with a stick. Che Guevara said that to a revolutionary, death is the reality and victory the dream. Because the revolutionary lives so dangerously, his survival is a miracle. Bakunin, who spoke for the most militant wing of the First International, made a similar statement in his Revolutionary Catechism. To him, the first lesson a revolutionary must learn is that he's a doomed man. Unless he understands this, he does not grasp the essential meaning of his life. When Fidel Castro and his small band were in Mexico preparing for the Cuban Revolution, many of the comrades had little understanding of Bakunin's rule. A few hours before they set sail, Fidel went from man to man, asking who should be notified in case of death. Only then did the deadly seriousness of the revolution hit home. Their struggle was no longer romantic. The scene had been exciting and animated, but when the simple, overwhelming question of death arose, everyone fell silent. Many so-called revolutionaries in this country, black and white, are not prepared to accept this reality. The Black Panthers are not suicidal, neither do we romanticize the consequences of revolution in our lifetime. Other so-called revolutionaries cling to an illusion 
that they might have their revolution and die of old age. That cannot be. I do not expect to live through our revolution, and most serious comrades probably share my realism. Therefore, the expression, revolution in our lifetime, means something different to me than it does to other people who use it. I think the revolution will grow in my lifetime, but I do not expect to enjoy its fruits. That would be a contradiction. The reality will be grimmer. I have no doubt that the revolution will triumph. The people of the world will prevail, seize power, seize the means of production, wipe out racism, capitalism, reactionary intercommunalism, reactionary suicide. The people will win a new world. Yet when I think of individuals in the revolution, I cannot predict their survival. Revolutionaries must accept this fact, especially the black revolutionaries in America, whose lives are in constant danger from the evils of a colonial society. Considering how we must live, it is not hard to accept the concept of revolutionary suicide. In this, we are different from white radicals. They are not faced with genocide. The greater, more immediate problem is the survival of the entire world. If the world does not change, all its people will be threatened by the greed, exploitation, and violence of the power structure in the American empire. The handwriting is on the wall. The United States is jeopardizing its own existence and the existence of all humanity. If Americans knew the disasters that lay ahead, they would transform this society tomorrow for their own preservation. The Black Panther Party is in the vanguard of the revolution that seeks to relieve this country of its crushing burden of guilt. We are determined to establish true equality and the means of creative work. Some see our struggle as a symbol of the trend towards suicide among blacks. Scholars and academics in particular have been quick to make this accusation. They fail to perceive differences. Jumping off a bridge is not the same as moving to wipe out the overwhelming force of an oppressive army. When scholars call our actions suicidal, they should be logically consistent and describe all historical revolutionary movements in the same way. Thus the American colonists, the French of the late 18th century, the Russians of 1917, the Jews of Warsaw, the Cubans, the NLF, the North Vietnamese, any people who struggle against a brutal and powerful force are suicidal. Also, if the Black Panthers symbolize the suicidal trend among blacks, then the whole third world is suicidal because the third world fully intends to resist and overcome the ruling class of the United States. If scholars wish to carry their analysis further, they must come to terms with that four-fifths of the world which is bent on wiping out the power of the empire. In those terms, the third world would be transformed from suicidal to homicidal, although homicidal is the unlawful taking of life, and the third world is involved only in defense. Is the coin then turned? Is the government of the United States suicidal? I think so. With this redefinition, the term revolutionary suicide is not as simplistic as it might seem initially. In coining the phrase, I took two knowns and combined them to make an unknown, a neoteric phrase in which the word revolutionary transforms the word suicide into an idea that has a different meaning and dimensions, 
applicable to a new and complex situation. My prison experience is a good example of revolutionary suicide in action. For prison is a microcosm of the outside world. From the beginning of my sentence, I defied the authorities by refusing to cooperate. As a result, I was confined to lockup, a solitary cell. As the months passed and I remained steadfast, they came to regard my behavior as suicidal. I was told that I would crack and break under the strain. I did not break, nor did I retreat from my position. I grew strong. If I had submitted to their exploitation and done their will, it would have killed my spirit and condemned me to a living death. To cooperate in prison meant reactionary suicide to me. While solitary confinement can be physically and mentally destructive, my actions were taken with an understanding of the risk. I had to suffer through a certain situation. By doing so, my resistance told them that I rejected all they stood for. Even though my struggle might have harmed my health, even killed me, I looked upon it as a way of raising the consciousness of the other inmates, as a contribution to the ongoing revolution. Only resistance can destroy the pressures that cause reactionary suicide. The concept of revolutionary suicide is not defeatist or fatalistic. On the contrary, it conveys an awareness of the reality in combination with the possibility of hope. Reality, because the revolutionary must always be prepared to face death, and hope, because it symbolizes a resolute determination to bring about change. Above all, it demands that the revolutionary see his death and his life as one piece. Chairman Mao says that death comes to all of us, but it varies in its significance. To die for the reactionary is lighter than a feather. To die for the revolution is heavier than Mount Tai. End of section.